Hey everyone, Eric Christensen here from MedEd101.com, also uh, the Real Life Pharmacology podcast. Uh, got a little update uh, as far as the ambulatory care uh, pharmacy certification. Uh, definitely a certification I am uh, familiar with for sure. Um, I want to run through uh, if there's you know some changes in things, content outline, uh, just general exam information uh, as well as study materials to uh, help you plan and, and prepare for this exam in, in 2024. So first and foremost, let's look back. I think that's important to do to recognize um, 2023 results. This is from the spring um, as I'm putting this together. Uh, the fall total results um, haven't uh, been published yet. I think they usually do that in January or February of, of uh, each year there. Uh, but anyway, the spring um, and the fall between 2023 didn't change. The content outline didn't change, the length of the exam, nothing changed between that. So I would anticipate pretty similar results uh, for the fall results too. So anyway, the spring results, as you can see, um, all candidates, uh, total percent passed is 60%. I would say that's pretty on par uh, with where we have been historically for the pass rate for the ambulatory care exam. First candidates tend to do first time candidates tend to do a little bit better. Uh, and in general, um, the ambulatory care exam tends to be maybe slightly easier than the BCPS exam. Uh, and maybe another comparable one, uh, the geriatric exam, it does tend to be a little bit easier um, than that one there as well. So digging into this exam, you're thinking about becoming board certified, you know, what's the process, what does the exam look like? Um, so first and foremost, we don't have any changes. That's, in my mind, that's generally a good thing, and I think, I think that helps, um, you know, us prepare a little bit better um, in that we're, we're knowing what to expect um, with our uh, study materials um, based on feedback and things that, that I get. Um, the exam itself in the number of questions actually is changing in 2024. So we are dropping to 150 questions, whereas historically, um, uh, at least 2023, it was 175. And actually, several years ago, um, it used to be 200. Uh, me personally, uh, I would probably rather have more questions. It feels like you know, maybe if you get in a bad stretch um, on your exam or not feeling confident in some of your answers, um, I think knowing that there's a lot of questions, I think helps me mentally. Um, so that's kind of a, a different um, uh, a challenge now that we've dropped down to uh, 150 questions. Um, but do recall that 25 of those questions out of that 150, uh, they're basically test questions, not graded for future exams. So that's really, really important to remember. So even if you get on a bad stretch of three, four, five in a row where you don't know the answer or things don't feel like they're going well, you have to remember that they could be questions that aren't graded. So keep your patience, keep your focus. Um, even if you're not doing that well or you don't feel like you're doing that well, um, you've got to maintain kind of an even keel. Um, and uh, anticipate that you know some of those could be questions that, that weren't graded, or at least that should be your mindset, in my opinion, um, to help you better uh, prepare and mentally plan for this. Uh, multiple choice questions, one answer with four possible alternatives total. Um, generic names, so brand names aren't utilized on the uh, BPS uh, pharmacy exams. Um, so I think that's probably a nice thing for most people. Um, but if you work in a place where you use a ton of brand names and you've been out of practice, uh, out of school for a little while, then maybe those generic names won't, won't come as quickly to you. So, uh, but anyway, be prepared for that. Uh, it's going to be all, all generic names. Uh, and then, of course, the content outline, which I'll dig into uh, further here, but we've got 75% is that patient-centered ambulatory care. And that's not all just pharmacotherapy, and I'll, I'll point that out. Coming up here, uh, translation of evidence into ambulatory care practice, ambulatory care practice advancement. 
One thing I really wanted to emphasize about this exam uh, and all the BPS exams is you have three hours and 45 minutes. So that's uh, for 150 questions, approximately 90 seconds per question. Um, so I, I, I truly believe it's really, really critical. I've, I've definitely had people email me in the past saying they didn't get through their exam because they were too slow, um, you know, whether it be a, a, you know, some case questions that took them too long to interpret or they couldn't decide on an answer. Um, so you've got to time yourself. That's really, really critical. Um, obviously, taking, you know, a full-length practice exam will help you do that. Um, or, you know, obviously practice questions in general. However you do it, definitely make sure to time yourself and see how long it's taking you to do questions. Uh, if you're historically a really, really slow test taker, uh, that's definitely even more incentive uh, to make sure that you're keeping up to speed and you're able to uh, keep pace uh, in making sure you finish the exam. Because any questions that you do not answer, they are counted as incorrect. So very, very critical here. So first off, 75% of the exam falls within patient-centered ambulatory care. So the majority of these 113 questions, or a good chunk of them, um, will be basically your pharmacotherapy questions. You know, your diabetes, asthma, COPD, depression, anxiety, so on and so forth. Um, so definitely um, focus on those bigger target areas and really hone in and understand what you're good at and what you know really, really well. And don't study that as much. Uh, these exams are kind of bigger, broader exams. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to focus your time um, on areas where you feel weaker and try to shore up those weaknesses. So again, focus on the big things to start, um, making sure that that you know those kind of insides and outs. Uh, you know, things like MS, thrombocytopenia, stuff where, you know, it's not real common. Um, I, I wouldn't say don't study them. I would say focus more on the bigger things in those type of kind of less common topics. Um, but don't, you know, spend tons and tons of time on some of those rare disease states. I mean, the likelihood is you're probably going to get one question at most. Um, from some of those less common disease states. Uh, when I'm talking to candidates, trying to prepare and plan for taking this exam, uh, I always relate it back to kind of two questions. Why would you use a medication? So that can be guidelines, um, compelling indications. And on the flip side, why you wouldn't use a medication. That might be contraindication, uh, drug interaction, maybe the adverse effect profile isn't very good for a patient. Um, those are, are when, I, when I think about pharmacotherapy and drug selection, those are two of the questions that I think about, why you would select a medication and why you wouldn't. And when you're studying those medications, um, understand those two questions and the things that go along with that. So be prepared uh, to analyze situations and scenarios. I mean, that's that's what's going to uh, come up in the, the questions for sure. Um, there, there'll likely be some, you know, more like straightforward trivia stuff as well. Um, but, you know, you'll, you'll be presented a situation and you'll be asked to basically select what is the best option in this situation. And so, um, you know, definitely doing practice questions and things like that can, can help kind of prepare you for that and, and get used to that. Uh, important things in relation to pharmacotherapy um, that I think are important to help you prepare and, and recognizing and understanding um, what's likely to be tested on. So contraindications, boxed warnings, um, compelling indications, obviously what the guidelines say, uh, what's the first drug that we're, we're going to use in most situations, um, major and unique adverse effects or most common and, and unique adverse effects there. Uh, monitoring, uh, definitely uh, important there as well, and then major drug interactions. Um, and then it's maybe been a little more emphasized over the last few years, in my opinion, but um, genetic considerations as well. So you think about um, medications like, you know, allopurinol, carbamazepine, uh, clopidogrel, another great example, where uh, genetic variations can impact whether that's a good choice for somebody or it's a a risky choice for somebody based upon those genetic variations. Uh, I am not a huge advocate 
uh, for focusing on dosing. Um, so like the, the odds that they ask you what the max dose of gabapentin is or cyclobenzaprine, like you're likely not going to be asked that question. Now, would you maybe have to recognize like, whoa, you know, gabapentin 800 milligrams four times a day. This patient has, you know, renal failure, like, whoa, that's a pretty big dose. Like that, that's probably an inappropriately high dose. So that's the kind of things that I would you know, hopefully you'll be able to recognize um, in in the exam. So I I don't recommend specifically like studying dose ranges and like what the minimum and maximum dose for every drug is. Um, I think that's probably a little bit of a waste of time. Um, exceptions, um, you know, if you've got drugs with with boxed warnings on certain doses or maximum doses as far as drug interactions go. Um, so some of the common ones I think about, you know, omeprazole and citalopram. That's a, a great example where maybe knowing the dose would, would be important there. Um, dosing of, you know, commonly used anticoagulants, like how would you adjust warfarin? Um, what dose of apixaban would you use in somebody that's, um, you know, maybe underweight with poor renal function and older age. So those are the type of situations where I would um, maybe focus a little bit more so uh, on paying attention to uh, dosages. Uh, that patient-centered ambulatory care, that 75%, that does include other things um, other than just kind of pharmacotherapy stuff. So that is important to recognize. We've gone through the content outline and obviously put a lot of that stuff into our study materials just to make sure you're, you're covered there. But um, some of the things that might come up, communication, prevention, educational barriers, health literacy, uh, interviewing techniques, uh, things like motivational interviewing, for example, there, um, recognizing adherence patterns and what to, what to do there, situations, uh, even things like quality metrics, you know, and recognizing um, how that impacts our patients and uh, impacts care in general. So uh, that patient-centered ambulatory care, again, not just about um, drug selection in general. And then the 15% portion is translation of evidence into ambulatory care practice. Uh, you are definitely very likely to have some questions on statistics and I think if you know statistics well, you can get these uh, questions correct fairly easily. At least that's been the experience um, uh, in, in the past. So definitely know statistics. It's going to help you get some guaranteed answers right on this exam. Um, it's very, very important for the ambulatory care exam. In addition, obviously, to BCPS, it might even be a little bit more emphasized in BCPS. Uh, but statistics, study design... Uh, some other things, pharmacoeconomics, population health. Uh, again, we've got that uh, kind of within our study package, and we've gone line through line, uh, line by line, um, through the content outline just to make sure that we didn't miss any terminology or any things that um, should should be in there. Uh, and then last but not least, we've got 10% of the exams, so approximately 15 questions. Uh, and this is in relation to basically ambulatory care, you know, terminologies and business models, things of that nature. So, um, you know, CMM, MTM, defining CMR, defining some of those things um, and how they relate to ambula ambulatory care practice and what they are. Uh, obviously, business models, you know, how does somebody make an ambulatory care pharmacy practice work uh, from a financial perspective? And there's, you know multiple different models there uh, that you, you may see out in real life and that we kind of share in our study materials and stuff too. Uh, and then there's some quality improvement things um, that, that may show up too. Educational strategies, uh, that shows up uh, in this, this section. Transitions of care, care coordination. So again, th these are kind of a little bit more difficult things to kind of study and prepare for. Um, but I think we, we do a better job than, than anybody else on this, having gone line through line through the content outline um, and put together content on this and help explain some of that terminology and how it relates uh, to uh, ambulatory care practice and pharmacy. We've got some study material options that will certainly help you prepare and, and pass this exam. We went line by line through the content outline just to make sure that we have 
uh, everything covered uh, to help you prepare for this exam. Uh, and then obviously I've got experience in taking uh, these exams as well, and uh, we get feedback yearly as well from some of our, our folks on things that should be covered more or less or whatever the case may be there. So I uh, really tried to you know, create the content in an efficient manner, making sure that you know, what you're studying is hopefully the most relevant uh, for the exam itself. So we've got over 20 hours of uh, video content now. I uh, updated over 20, uh, approximately 20 videos for 2024. That's just based on, you know, new guidelines, drugs, changes, things that, um, you know, were maybe practice changing in various topic areas there. Uh, well over a thousand slides. Uh, question bank comes with that, uh, as well as two full length practice exams. So again, that importance of, I think, timing yourself. Um, and we obviously provide the, the practice exams in the exact format of the um, BCP, BCACP exam. Uh, we include a statistics study guide as a separate PDF as well as an ambulatory care and regulatory study guide. Again, went line by line making sure we cover everything on the content outline. Uh, also got some comparison tables and stuff too that can uh, maybe help you organize your, your studying thoughts. So uh, we've got one year or six month access um, depending upon you know, how long you have to take the exam, uh, either option I think is, is reasonable. One year obviously is a little bit better value. Uh, so where you don't have to pay for two six month accesses, if you, um, are one of those, you know, 30 to 40% that, that don't pass the exam. So there's no shame in that. I mean, it's a difficult exam. Um, but some, yeah, choose that, that one year pass just to make sure they're covered. Uh, and then if you've got study materials, um, you know, through another organization or whatever the case may be, um, we do have the question bank only option where you get the question bank as well as the two full length practice exams. If you just want a different feel, um, want different questions and, or maybe questions in general. So um, that's definitely an option uh, for you as well. But best value will certainly be the, the all access pass. Uh, and then here's some uh, testimonials just uh, received from from this year. Um, you know, you can read those, hit pause and read those for yourself if you want. Um, also, plenty of testimonials too from, from previous years that um, I can share there too. And if you're looking for those study materials, you can find them at meded101.com slash store. Just click the uh, BCACP tab. Uh, and that'll take you right to those options. If you have any questions, um, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to me at mededucation101 at gmail.com. I try to respond to every email I get. Sometimes it may take a, a couple of days, but um, I do my best to, uh, uh, get to get to all your questions and uh, try to help ease your fears on this uh, challenging uh, venture that you're taking. So hopefully that helps. Again, feel free to reach out to me by, by email, and I'm wishing you all the best in 2024.